Good evening, everyone. I'm Melissa Wilkinson from the education team at the PHN. Welcome. I'd like to acknowledge the local custodians of the land in which we meet this evening and honour elders past, present and emerging. Just a little bit of housekeeping. There will be a poll as per usual at the end of the session. I strongly encourage you to please complete that. We are being recorded tonight and a copy of this will be available in our education library. Um, if you have any questions as well, please pop them into the questions box and we'll endeavour to get to those towards the end of the session. Um, and any that we don't get to will be forwarded on to the presenters as well for you. Um, I now hand over to Dr Penelope uh, Fortingham to start commence the session. Thanks, Penelope. Hello, everyone. Many thanks for attending tonight. Um, I'm going to be running through some of the basics of antenatal care and the changes focusing on the first trimester. Um, please, uh, please do feel free to ask any questions and pop them in the chat and um, I'll endeavour to answer them at the end. So in the spirit of reconciliation, on behalf of both the Central Coast Local Health District and the University of Newcastle, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are attending today. So the learning outcomes that we'd like to cover today are to understand the models of care options for women on the Central Coast, um, understand how we risk stratify women for antenatal care and the referral requirements that currently exist, understand the basic management of miscarriage and referral requirements for this, and following after me, um, there'll be some further information from Rachel Petherbridge to understand the management of hyperemesis and the future changes that are happening in the local health district um, mm -hmm. so that you're informed of things as they occur. The content I would like to cover um, briefly, but hopefully thoroughly enough for you all, is preconception care, the models of antenatal care, the different referral options, as I mentioned, and the early pregnancy complications. So covering things such as diagnosis of miscarriage and management of it, and also what to do with uncertain ultrasound findings. So preconception care, um, when we think about pregnancy, people often think about just first, second and third trimester, but I like to think about it as five parts. So you have preconception care, first, second and third trimester, um, and then postnatal care as well. So preconception care is a really important part of caring for a woman um, because what we aim to do with this is to minimise the risks to the subsequent pregnancies for both the mother and the fetus. In order to do this, we really do need to think about what the woman's needs are, both from a medical and a social setting. So we need to take a comprehensive history of the woman and her partner to understand what could affect the pregnancy. The aim is to be able to identify modifiable factors. So of course, if someone has existing medical conditions, we want to stabilise these, ensure that they have appropriate referral or follow-up with specialists and allied health. Think about the medications that they have been on or are currently on, obviously ceasing strategies and seeking advice if we're unsure. Just stop for two seconds, that noise is gone, yeah. Um, Obviously, and you know that there are groups such as Mother Safe New South Wales, which you can refer your patients to, or you can call yourself if you have um, concerns about medications that anyone is on. Thinking about um, the BMI of the patient, optimising their weight and diet through good nutrition and encouraging appropriate physical activity. Thinking about risks to pregnancy, so that includes foods, both viral and bacterial contacts that could relate to their workplace or their home environment. Ceasing harmful behaviours such as smoking, alcohol and illicit substances and obviously thinking about from all these things what risk category that person might be for a pregnancy and thinking about how this might influence the model of care that they may be eligible for in the pregnancy. The two other aspects that we think about with preconception care briefly are thinking about how it can work from a screening point of view to minimise risk to the pregnancy. 
So as you know, we think about screening for sexually transmitted infections. Are they up to date with their CSTs? Thinking about things such as genetic carrier screening, their blood group and rhesus antibody status. Are they immune for vaccine preventable diseases? Do they need to have vaccination as indicated? Thinking about what preventative medications they should be taking. So obviously folate and iodine, but potentially thinking about things such as aspirin, calcium and vitamin D as well. And obviously importantly, thinking about mental health and safety screening for women, identifying women who are at risk, but really universally, we should be thinking about offering supports and counselling options to women, because as you know, many people won't disclose any safety risks at home or won't disclose if they have concerns regarding their mental health. And thinking about how these might not be disclosed as well, you know, based on the socio-cultural influences of that woman and what that means, what she may think about pregnancy in that context. And the other important aspect of preconception care is really thinking about timing. So women may be on a current form of contraception. We need to think about when they should cease that um, within the time frame for that wish their fertility wishes exist within. Thinking about that they understand the costs that would be involved in the different models of antenatal care. Thinking about vaccines, if you're giving live vaccines, when that would impact on them falling pregnant, if they need to stabilise medical conditions, when that would impact on them. Thinking about as well, is this someone who may need a referral for assisted reproductive technology or other specialists and what time frame that would happen in? And also just to let you know, if they have had a previous pregnancy with a significant trauma, such as an admission to an intensive care unit, and they may need to discuss through these issues, we do have a new clinic which is commencing at Gosford called the Reflect Clinic, where women can be referred who wish to understand what happened in their previous pregnancy better um, and be able to discuss this through with a clinician before they become pregnant um, or during their pregnancy. Um, so that's important for women who may have previous birth trauma as related to what happened to them in their pregnancy, and then they're given an opportunity to be able to understand that and ask questions about it in more detail. So as you know, the, the recommendation for antenatal care is that women should have her first antenatal visit by 10 weeks. Um, we stratify risk for the woman based on her parity and her previous pregnancies. In general, a first pregnancy, a schedule of 10 visits is recommended. If you have a subsequent low risk pregnancy, then we have a schedule of seven visits recommended. And the links to where I've cited these references from are in the slides, so you, I'm sure you know where they are, but you can have a look at them yourself as well. The models of care that exist for women are quite varied. Um, as you can see, there's a list of seven that I've got here. Um, and they obviously involve different health professionals potentially and different amounts of contact with a hospital care setting. Um, so the model of GP antenatal shared care, which is mixed care in the community with primary health care by the GP and some care through the hospital system, which women can elect um, for when they when they become pregnant, as they have a GP that is happy to provide that care for them. And obviously, if they don't have um, risk factors that mean that they might need to have a higher degree of appointments through the hospital system. We have also midwifery group practice. So this is a specific group of midwives who look after a group, look after patients with the, as the primary carer for them. Um, so that means that they will manage them throughout the pregnancy, throughout their labour and delivery and their postnatal period um, in order to have continuity of care for those women. And those first, those first two models that we've um, talked about offer great continuity of care for women because in the primary care setting, as you know, you may see women prior to pregnancy, during pregnancy and after pregnancy if you're offering them antenatal shed care, um, which is really giving them great continuity of care. Midwifery group practice as well gives them great continuity of care because they see the same person throughout that pregnancy and postnatal period. We also have other models which are more um, hospital based, so midwifery led antenatal care. So this is for women who we think are low risk in the pregnancy um, or who have healthcare conditions that are able to be managed by our fantastic midwives at Gosford Hospital. Um, so they, women will come into this model and have their appointments through the hospital system. Um, but they will have the majority of their appointments with the midwives. And if they need escalations in their care, then that will be done through to the obstetric team as appropriate. 
And then many women have a mix of midwifery and medical antenatal care. So these may be women who have some identified risk factors in their pregnancy. Those, those means, that means that they need to have some input from the medical team. So they may have some scheduled appointments throughout their pregnancy time or in, so that, that they can have advice from the medical team at that point in time, but the majority of their care would happen with the midwives. And then women that have had, obviously, have significant health issues, have had potential significant events in previous pregnancies that put them into the higher risk categories, then they would have obstetric leg and antenatal care, um, which means the majority of their care then is happening through the medical led models, but they still do see midwives throughout their care as well. And obviously there are the private options for women as well. So women may elect to have a private midwife um, and that may include um, electing to have a birth outside of the hospital system, so having a home birth um, or a birth in a private midwifery centre and obviously private obstetric care as well. So women may choose an obstetrician um, to manage them throughout their pregnancy and their labour and delivery and postnatal periods. So it is very diverse and obviously how women wish to have their model of care and how we keep them safe are important things to consider when you're thinking about the model of care that a woman will have for her pregnancy. So the risk stratification that happens in the hospital is that we classify women into a risk category following the Australian College of Midwives um, referral referral systems. So they get given a level based on the things that we have concerns for them. And that might be their past medical history. It might be previous pregnancies. Um, it might be their concerns about the pregnancy. They may have other risk factors that are identified through their screening investigations um, that mean that we um, re-look at what their risk categories are. And it's important that we, that risk strategy is something which is mobile. So every visit that someone comes in, if the health is of the mother or the health of the fetus has changed, then we would obviously reassess what their risk is and reassess the model of care as required. So some new initiatives just to quickly go through for you. You probably have heard about the Safer Baby Bundle, which is an initiative by the Clinical Excellence Commission. Um, it's a multi-pronged approach to look at improving the health of women in their pregnancy and decreasing risks for them. So as you can see, there's multiple categories there. So we've got smoking cessation, looking at fetal growth restriction and preventing that or identifying it early understanding decreased fetal movements, side sleeping for women um, to minimise their risk of um, impaired blood flow, which could potentially contribute to stillbirth and thinking about the appropriate timing of birth. So the things that obviously are probably more relevant for primary care in early parts of pregnancy are smoking cessation, thinking about fetal growth restriction screening. Um, and under that comes aspirin. So I'm sure that you are well aware that we use low-dose aspirin for women who have had previous preeclampsia, who have hypertension or risk factors for hypertension, starting that primarily before 16 weeks for the best effects. Um, but the new pathway for fetal growth restriction, which you can find by clicking on that link on the Clinical Excellence Commission page, um, also identifies risk factors for growth restriction. And if women have multiple risk factors for that, then aspirin is also recommended at a low dose for these women as well. So referral, that's obviously a very important part to integrate the care of the woman in the community um, with the care of the woman in the hospital. We obviously want to know in the hospital everything about the woman that could possibly impact on her pregnancy care. Um, and I think it's really important that the assumption is made that we actually don't have any information on the woman and everything is sent through to us. The re Obviously, the things that we can potentially easily sort are her pathology results or her ultrasound results if we know where they're being done. But the other things that are really important is information that can't be found in the test results, which is especially important when we want to offer appropriate continuity of care to women. So things such as her views on the pregnancy and her health that she may have discussed with you, 
um, things that you know from a previous relationship with this with this woman, so her psychosocial and cultural influences and how they impact on her thoughts about pregnancy or on the pregnancy, the family supports you know about, what risks that exist for the women that you might be concerned about, such as unsafe home environments, a previous history of physical, sexual or coercive violence, and obviously her previous pregnancy experiences. And I think it's a really important point that like, I know that sometimes the communication isn't great both ways from the hospital to the primary health GPs or, or vice versa. So we, as you may feel sometimes you don't get a great amount of information about what happened in the hospital, we, often, we don't know what happened to people once they've left the hospital system a lot of the time. So we don't know about her postnatal experiences, um, if she's developed birth trauma, how these things would affect her care. Um, so it's really helpful if we are given this information by people that have had a longer relationship with um, the woman than we may have had in the hospital setting. Um, we obviously cover this information in our formal booking and visit at the hospital, but it's really important, as you know, that you and us as clinicians want to offer person-centred care and be really have clear communication and that really helps that process for the woman that she knows that her wants and needs that have been expressed in the primary care are followed up on when she comes into the hospital system. So the initial antenatal investigations that we do, now you know what these are. Um, this is just a quick reviser. Obviously these are screening tests for potential conditions that can influence the pregnancy and they may diagnose something of concern. There's a lot of ones on the right hand side which are consider. So this may be again your personal risk stratification of that individual or you may do them routinely for people. Uh, so thinking about chlamydia, gonorrhea, trichomonas, other STIs, if they look, if they are someone who potentially is vitamin D deficient, supplementing this, thinking about occupational disease exposures such as CMV and toxoplasmosis, and considering thyroid um, function tests if these are indicated. Obviously, we want to know maternal blood group and rhesus status and antibody screening as well. And a quick update for you um, that the National Blood Authority updated their guidelines on anti-D in 2021. The link is there for that. And this flowchart, I'm sorry, is very small, but you can find it at the link which is there. Uh, so the things that haven't changed that you obviously would know is that we do anti-D um, testing for rhesus negative women at 28 and 34 weeks and we administer anti-D if they're antibody negative. And this is also done post Pardon for a non-sensitised woman with a positive fetus. Uh, the thing that has changed is that the guideline now does recommend that if it is an option, fetal blood group screening is done on the NIPT for all RH negative women. It's not currently universally available and it's only funded for certain high risk women, as you can see at the bottom. So high risk uh, rhesus D negative pregnant women who are anti-D immunised, high risk rhesus D negative pregnant women who have obstetric indications for it, such as severe fetal maternal hemorrhage um, or other, which is always one of the categories. So in the future, it will be that anyone who has a negative blood group is going to have NAPT fetal blood group screening, but there's currently a working party which is looking at how this will be implemented. Now, this you will know, I'm sure you know, but I'm going to just quickly run through diagnosing pregnancy. Um, so obviously you do need to know the last menstrual period of the lady and the length of cycles that she has had to work out an estimated due date for her. Obviously it's important that we discuss with the women that this is an estimated due date, not a definite due date, that might alleviate some of the confusion that they have when their ultrasound scans that they have subsequently don't quite match up with what that is. We think about her symptoms of pregnancy um, and what we need to do to look after those. And, and from that, if we want to have some objective information, we can obviously do a quantitative blood beta HCG to confirm a urine beta HCG. And if there's any concerns about the viability of the pregnancy, that can be tracked. From the point of view of ultrasound, we we do universally expect to see an intrauterine pregnancy on a transvaginal ultrasound when the beta-HCG is greater than 1500 to 2000. 
Um, if you don't and they have a high beta HCG, then potentially it's either a non viable pregnancy or it's a twin pregnancy. So they have a higher beta HCG when the structures are smaller. If you get to the state where you don't have a fetal pole with a gestational sac, which is a mean sac diameter of 25 millimetres, as you know, that is therefore by definition a non viable pregnancy. And if we don't see fetal cardiac activity with a fetal pole of seven millimetres, that is also a non viable pregnancy. And from the point of view of if it isn't what I expect, if it's low, it could be non viable, um, and we would manage it through monitoring the VDHG and ultrasound. It could obviously be an ectopic pregnancy. Um, and that could be diagnosed through ultrasound, a beta HCG, which is static or slow, or obviously a clinical presentation that would warrant referral to the early pregnancy clinic or the hospital if it's acute, if someone is acutely unwell to the emergency department. And obviously, if it's high, it could indicate that it is a multiple pregnancy or a complicated pregnancy with either a partial or complete mole or a malignancy. So it's Picking up, not a pregnancy, unfortunately, um, but a malignancy. And as you, you will know this, how to manage a failed intrauterine pregnancy. This is obviously what happens in the early pregnancy assessment service. So expectant management where women wait for the physical miscarriage once that has been diagnosed. And the process usually takes up to two weeks. Um, and in that time, women are checked up on. Um, through our early pregnancy clinic and I'm sure that that is your practice as well in primary care um, where they have phone calls or text messages to see how they're travelling and then they come back for review as required. Medical management um, is generally done with misoprostol um, so that's 800 micrograms which, which is given vaginally and there are different regimes for this that you will read about. And obviously, if people have not had any response to that after 24 to 48 hours, then we tend to give them a repeat dose of that or discuss about what options they want to pursue at that point in time for management. It's important, obviously, to counsel women about analgesia and antiemetics as they need, um, what to expect um, with this management. And its so success rate is around 85% if the pregnancy is less than nine weeks of gestation or size. And then surgical management, so the obviously the U again would understand dilation and curatage of the uterus, which has around an up to 98% success rate, but early pregnancies can be missed sometimes with this option. Um, and that would be discussed with a woman um, if that's what she chooses when she has an early diagnosis or small amount of contents um, inside her uterus on ultrasound. And then just quickly from the point of view of a refresher on a tubal ectopic pregnancy, I'm not talking about the other types of ectopic pregnancies, the same three categories again. Um, the management of these women with an expectant management obviously depends on the uh, safety netting of that woman. Is she an appropriate candidate for expectant management? Will she follow up? Does she have a safe home environment that is near healthcare services? And really, we only choose that if they have quite a low beta HCG and it's either a tubal ectopic or a pregnancy of unknown origin. And then the other two options are surgical or medical. Obviously, if a woman is hemodynamically unstable, then you would be sending her to the emergency department and surgical management is her only option. Um, for those that are stable, that have a beta HCG above 200 and who do not wish surgical management, then medical management with methotrexate is an option for them. And that is run through our early pregnancy clinic um, as well, or through the gynaecology clinic um, for some of the follow-up. And we would obviously want to make sure that when women have this option that we know that it has worked. So we do follow them up over time um, to make sure that their beta HCG level does drop down to less than five and that we safety net them as well, because even though they're having methotrexate as a treatment, there is a still a small risk of rupture of an ectopic pregnancy. And we do want them to represent if they have any concerning symptoms. So from the point of view of referral to EPAS, um, obviously you know that you can refer um, patients to EPAS. Women can also self-refer, but we usually would link in with a the GP then to get further information regarding them. 
Um, again, all the relevant information regarding their pregnancy would, should be sent through, as well as a full medical history to help us to inform her care, as well as the psychosocial and cultural impacts that would be relevant for us to know. And I'm sure that many of you um, have seen women who've been to the EPAS and then potentially have been referred back to you for ongoing follow-up, regardless of whether that pregnancy was continuing or not. Um, and I'm sure also that if you have also referred women to the early pregnancy clinic, if you've had ultrasound findings that you thought needed follow-up um, more quickly than potentially getting into an antenatal clinic service. And the EPAS service obviously provides the management of the pregnancy that I've referred to in the last few slides, but also psychosocial supports for the patient and their partner and family as is required. And just a quick last few slides on antenatal screening tests, um, which obviously provide an estimate of increased risk in the baby of having structural genetic and chromosomal anomalies and other health problems. Um, you know what they are. We offer the combined first trimester screening, the non-invasive prenatal test, which should be combined with a fetal structural scan and very rarely done now, the second trimester blood screening, given that the non-invasive prenatal screening has taken over from that. Uh, it's an important that this is obviously offered as a choice to all women in the pregnancy and that they be counselled about what the risks are for a pregnancy for them on their age group and then in the, in the context of the results of these tests. And as you know, diagnostic tests are an option for women if they come back as a higher risk result with any of those tests. Um, we offer through our maternal fetal medicine units, the uh, chorionocular sampling, which can be performed after 11 weeks of pregnancy if the placenta is in an appropriate position. And uh, amniocentesis, oh, I'm sorry, that should be after 15 weeks, I apologize, um, of pregnancy. Um, once the membranes have fused to the myometrium and there's a less risk of ruptured membranes with that procedure. And ultrasound structural scans, we don't classically put them in under the diagnostic category, but they can diagnose structural anomalies such as skeletal malformations, spina bifida and encephaly, lack of appropriate organ development, which is why it's so important that that is done as well as an NIPT, because someone might have a low risk result on an NIPT, but have a structural anomaly in that baby that then isn't picked up until 18 to 20 weeks if they don't have any scanning um, at that 12 week mark. So just a quick reminder that um, there is a lot of information on the Central Coast Health Pathways under the category of pregnancy that you can access. Um, so the Health Pathways for the Central Coast, um, as you can see there, the username there is Central Coast, the password is OneConnect. So when you go on to that, it has lots of information about pregnancy and also when you look in the antenatal section, it has the referral, the current referral um, sheet for the CCLHD at the bottom. We are in the process of updating that and hopefully that will be ready in the second half of the year so it's more comprehensive and easier for you to use. And also from the point of view of the patients, if you want to direct them to information then you can send them to the patient info site which is on the right hand side there and does not require a pass password to use it. Um, so that's just the information there and from the point of view to introduce our next speaker there is a recent update to the nausea vomiting and hyperemesis in pregnancy pathway on health updates health up, on your health pathways um, so that is something that you can have a look at after this um, next part of this part of the talk if you want to have a quick look through um, some of the information which is on that side So that's just showing you how to get to it when you get into it. If you look under pregnancy referrals, that's where there's information there um, to, as I spoke to you about um, referring um, to the hospital system as required. So I might stop there and let us swap on to the next speaker, Rachel. Hi. <clears throat> Thanks everyone, my name is uh, Rachel Pepperbridge and I'll be presenting the second half of this webinar, webinar on hyperemesis um, gravidarum and the uh, Ministry of Health initiative that um, we've been working on. Um, from here onwards, for brevity, I will refer to hyperemesis gravidarum as HG. Um, I'm working with Jane Peters, who's here with me this evening, um, as the Joint Clinical Midwifery Consultant Project Lead. 
Um, this initiative um, has complex collaboration between the Ministry of Health, the Central Coast Local Health District uh, Maternity Services, the Emergency Departments, Hospital in the Home Services, the Primary Health Network, um, and the surrounding districts throughout New South Wales. Um, and we would like to thank the partners, including the PHM, for their interest and desire to um, facilitate positive change for women. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the original custodians of the land and pay my respect to the elders past, present and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Aboriginal Australia. Um, today we are meeting on the Darkinjul people. So just to give a brief outline of what I'll be going over um, for the next um, little while, um, Penelope's given a great update of antenatal care and I'll be presenting an overview of the HG project, the defining characteristics of hyperemesis, its impact on women and families. Um, I'll discuss um, a Pukey 24 scoring tool. Um, um, the treatment modalities for HG and some exciting changes that are coming to the existing health service to streamline care services. I'll speak for approximately 20 minutes and leave some time for questions so that you can all go back to your families on this lovely evening. So in November 2020, the New South Wales government announced an allocation of $17 million into education and support to improve the care of women experiencing HG. It's a four year project and it aims to increase clinician and consumer awareness, understanding and attitudes towards HG, develop and streamline new pathways to care within the existing main service setting, improve the integration between hospital community and primary care providers, and ensure that all women with HG are identified, assessed and managed consistently and in line with best practice. Um, and we're going to increase the research and improve the evaluation of the clinical care as well. If you hear anything tonight, um, hear this. HG is not just morning sickness. Um, it's characterised by severe nausea and vomiting of pregnancy that begins um, under 16 weeks. It can lead to dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. It has a significant impact on a woman's quality of life and severely limits her daily activities. It's the main cause of hospitalisation for women in the first half of pregnancy. And Australian observational studies cite an incidence of about 1%, but more recent evidence indicates that HG is actually underreported and it's more likely around the 3%. The cause of HG is unknown. Numerous factors have been implicated, including particularly high levels of beta HCG, such as is found in multiple pregnancies and gestational trophoblastic disease. Uh, there also seems to be a genetic predisposition with it occurring in families. And there is an emerging link to the GD15 gene, um, which is the focus of emerging research. Currently, there's no accepted universal definition for HG, which, consists, um, which contributes to a lack of consistency in identification and diagnosis. Um, fortunately though, a validated scoring system has been uh, endorsed by the Ministry and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, over the coming slides. So um, from focus group research conducted by the Ministry of Health with primary health clinicians, a distinct lack of clarity around the care of women with HG um, was identified. And some of the main challenges that were identified included um, an absence of consistent clinical guidelines for healthcare providers to support the management of women with HG, an inequity of access to services such as hospital in the home and similar programs. There was a lack of com confidence um, recommending treatment medication for women with HG from primary healthcare providers. Um, there has been historically limited education available on assessment and management um, of HG across multidisciplinary areas, including um, the primary health network, emergency departments, nursing, midwifery, obstetrics. Um, there's a really poor understanding of the mental health needs of women with HG, and there's a really significant variation in the clinical views, beliefs and attitudes and the practices regarding HG. So in a time where millions of dollars um, of resources could be injected into any area of health where the burden of disease 
is admittedly small relative to other illnesses, why HG? It's a really fair question um, and the answer lies at the heart of women's experiences. As we've noted earlier, there's a significant lack of awareness and understanding of HG amongst the community in general, as well as healthcare providers. As part of our project, Jane and I reached out to consumers on social media to ask women to tell their stories and experiences of HG. And what we heard was quite shocking. So in response to our social media post um, on the Central Coast Local Health District Facebook page, asking for women's experience of HG, within 48 hours, we've received over 145 comments, hundreds of shares, and 41 e women emailed us their experiences in great detail. Um, this is part of a letter from a woman I will call Sarah, it's not her real name. Um, she suffered from HG with both her pregnancies for her two children, and she wrote to me. From about six weeks pregnant until near the end of my pregnancy, I suffered terribly. I would call it the most traumatic time in my life. I was bedridden, I had to quit my job, I had to leave my studies at university and I became an empty shell that could never eat or drink. I couldn't even wash my hair or go to the toilet without vomiting violently. I suffered quietly at home for the most part, but every week I would end up in the emergency department due to being so sick, dehydrated and not knowing how to help myself. There was a lack of education within the hospital and I often left no better than I started, but also feeling really guilt guilty like I'd wasted the ED staff's time. To this day, I still have PTSD from my hyperemesis. Jane and I conducted a further 20 telephone interviews with consenting women, and there were recurring themes that arose, including the huge psychological burden that HG had on the women, their relationships, and the lasting impact on the mental health, often many years after their babies were born. I'll talk more about the impact of HG in the next few slides, but for a poorly understood illness with little awareness, the impact is big. And this speaks to the heart of the YHG. The literature supports the finding from our consumer engagement with the psychosocial burden of HG evident in research conducted in this area. The intractable and debilitating nausea and vomiting that women experience severely adversely affects their quality of life. A survey published in the Journal of Perinatology reported that 82% of women with HG reported negative psychosocial changes, with the socioeconomic consequences involving job loss being an important burden, with the resultant financial stresses. In fact, paid employment was found to be an independent risk factor for anxiety. A 2011 study reported in the Journal of Maternal, Fetal and Neonatal Medicine um, assessing postpartum outcomes noted high levels of PTSD with the associated negative outcomes, including an inability to breastfeed and relationship problems. High rates of secondary depression and anxiety are also really well reported in the literature. Sadly, termination of pregnancy rates are also higher amongst women diagnosed with HG and they give birth to fewer children. One international study cited a 15% termination of pregnancy rate in women with HG. And these women were three times more likely to describe their healthcare, provider, healthcare providers as uncaring and lacking understanding. <clears throat> Physiologically, um, the nutritional deficiencies and electrolyte disturbances are the most common maternal complications, in addition to loss of muscle mass and Mallory Weiss tears from forcible vomiting. Where Nicky's encephalopathy caused by thiamine deficiency is a rare complication. There is an increased risk of preeclampsia and placental abruption due to placental insufficiency. And as you've heard, the psychological impact of HG is significant and the resultant impact on the family unit. From a neonatal perspective, babies born to mothers with hyperemesis, unlike our little friends here, are more likely to have a low birth weight, be small for gestational age and be born premature. There's some recent research looking at the cognitive abilities of children born to mothers hospitalised with HG compared with those who were managed as outpatients for milder nausea and vomiting. And it was found that children of hospitalised mothers had significant lower median scores on their verbal performance and full scale IQ assessments. More recent research was published in 2020 and it's mirrored similar cognitive outcomes. 
So this will be a space to watch in the future. Shane and I looked at um, two years data from January 2020 to examine presentations that were coded as hyperemesis or severe nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. From the 12 months commencing January 1st, 2020, there were 276 ED presentations for Wyong and Gosford EDs combined. Um, they were obviously fairly evenly split um, and very similar numbers of presentations occurred in the following 12 months. So the admission rate for these presentations at each facility was around 24% for Wyong and 18% for Gosford. So it's a comparatively small burden of disease, but as you've heard for those families, the impact is significant. When we looked a little bit closer at the data, um, we could see that women experienced a mean wait time of just over four hours and had an average length of stay of three hours and 52 minutes. The majority of presentations occurred Monday to Friday between 7 and 5 p.m., which is very civilised. The representation rate within 48 hours was just under 4%, but we noted it was very common for women to have multiple presentations over the course of their pregnancy, um, with one woman having 13 presentations to ED in a single pregnancy. So improving the identification, assessment and management of women with HG is the core business for this initiative. And so with that in mind, uh, let's begin with identification. It's really, really simple. Um, ask every woman at every visit between four and 16 weeks gestation about nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. If nausea and vomiting of pregnancy have been identified, then we need to assess or quantify the severity of her symptoms. And the Mother Wrist Pukey 24 assessment tool is a validated tool and it's been proven to be simple and reliable. Pukey stands for the Pregnancy Unique Quantification of Emesis and Nausea. And it's scored over 24 hours and asks three simple questions related to the duration of nausea and the frequency of vomiting and dry retching symptoms. Um, it's really a fantastic tool. It's been shown to correlate very closely with a woman's overall quality of life. Um, so simply, as you can see there on the screen, it's just asking these three questions. First one, in the last 24 hours, for how long have you felt nauseated or sick to your stomach? And then the woman can choose um, on a scale of you know, one to five, how many hours she's um, been nauseated. In the last 24 hours, have you vomited or thrown up? In the last 24 hours, how many times have you had retching or dry heaves without bringing anything up? So the severity of the symptoms are assessed as mild, moderate or severe, with women scoring in the severe range by definition experiencing HG. Um, and this is a really useful tool for clinicians um, and also for women so that they can see where their symptoms sit, sit within the scale and what might be the best management for her. Um, this Pukey24 tool is on your Central Coast Health Pathways uh, webpage. So women presenting to the emergency department or um, their GP require a full, full clinical assessment, including a history, physical exam, including temp, heart rate, BP and her weight. Um, abdominal palpation to check for tenderness or signs of peritonism and an assessment of their hydration status, including skin turgor, examination of the mucous membranes, urine output and urinalysis and a postural drop in BP. For women scoring greater than or equal to 13 on the PUKI score, um, they will require pathology for EUCs, LFTs, um, calcium, magnesium and phosphate. Um, and a TSH um, only in those women with um, hyperemesis or nausea and vomiting, which is refractory to treatment um, or where there are signs of thyrotoxicosis. Um, if they haven't had one, an abdominal, um, sorry, an obstetric ultrasound should be performed to assess for multiple gestation um, and gestational trophoblastic disease. Um, there are numerous potential differential um, diagnoses um, that may be um, evident, which could be gastrointestinal, genitourinary, metabolic or CNS derived, and these need to be excluded. Symptoms such as abdominal pain, fever, headache and neck stiffness are not features of um, nausea and vomiting of pregnancy or HG and suggest an alternate diagnosis. And then lastly, but very importantly, given the significant psychological impact of HG, a mental health assessment should also be um, considered, and this can include an Edinburgh 
postnatal depression scale or the nausea and vomiting qol qol um, in, within the hospital system the edinburgh scale is the um, stand tool that we use for, for um, this assessment so just looking at the key principles of holistic management so first and foremost we want to um, in, implement some in interventions to reduce nausea vomiting and retching we want to manage the associated reflux and constipation. Um, it can be a bit of a vicious cycle. Most women have um, significant reflux from the vomiting and nausea and constipation because they're dehydrated and their fluid intake is minimal, but also if they're prescribed um, medications such as on Dansetron, that can compound the, the constipation. So just making sure that we're looking at um, the management in a, in a really holistic way. Um, maintain her hydration um, as well as fluid and electrolytes maintain nutrition, maximise her psychosocial support and monitor any side effects and prevent adverse pregnancy and fetal outcomes. So um, we'll just have a look at that a little bit more. So um, the non-pharmacological um, remedies that have been proposed um, and the ones that I'm going to discuss here have published data. So fatigue is a common um, symptom, particularly in the first trimester, and it has been associated with worsening of pregnancy nausea. Um, increasing rest, including napping when other young children do, um, and where possible, reducing workloads can offer some benefit. Women should be encouraged to alter their diet to minimise symptoms and eat and drink whatever and whenever they can to maintain nutrition and hydration. Uh, the standard recommendations are small frequent meals that are low in fat. Pregnancy multivitamins, particularly those containing iron, um, often contribute to um, nausea symptoms and they can be ceased um, if they are making women's nausea and vomiting worse, but where possible they should continue with their folic acid and iodine. There are minimal English language studies that report on the use of traditional acupuncture for the treatment of nausea and vomiting, but those that are available report no adverse outcomes with um, minimal clinical improvement. But if a woman is reporting that they're giving her some, some relief, then, then that, can be, um, that can be encouraged with, with minimal risk of harm. Um, and as discussed previously, the psychosocial support for women should be, should be maximised. So pharmacologically, um, the, the treatments, as I've mentioned before, involve antiemetics, acid, acid suppression, laxatives, steroids, and other supplements. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on these in the next slide. Um, the most significant factor in prescribing treatment is the potential risk of teratogenicity, as most treatments are commenced in the first trimester when embryogenesis is occurring. The majority of pharmacological treatment is, is off license and it's um, based on historical experience. Um, in all cases, an assessment of the maternal and fetal risks needs to be considered based on an individual circumstances and of course a woman's choices and what she would like to do. Um, I'm just going to go briefly into the medications um, and uh, at this point in time, the, um, the 2019 SOMANCE guidelines provide a really solid overview of the pharmacological management. Hopefully in the next month or two, the New South Wales Ministry of Health guidelines will supersede the SOMANCE guidelines and they should be utilised once they're published. We're hoping that that will um, occur hopefully in the next month or two and those, those will be um, available. So for women with mild nausea, and vomiting. Um, oral ginger and pyridoxine um, can provide some relief um, with no increased risk of teratogenicity. Um, the evidence for the efficacy on vomiting is low um, and these women can be managed at home. Women scoring in the moderate range on the PUKI tool for nausea and vomiting can benefit from um, metoclopramide, procorperazine, doxylamine, promethazine or indanzatron. All of these medications, excluding ondansetron, have shown no increased risk of teratogenicity. Ondansetron has conflicting data, but there doesn't appear to be any increase. Metoclopramide has been shown to be as effective as ondansetron for nausea, but less effective in vomiting. Women scoring in this range may also require acid suppression, such as ranitidine, and when combined with antiemetics, um, has been shown to reduce the pukey spores and improve the quality of life. Um, and these women can require IV fluids on an outpatient basis. And I'll just reiterate that some of the benefit and the beauty of the PUKI tool um, is that it breaks down um, the quantification of the symptoms into nausea, vomiting or dry retching because the medication that is prescribed um, by yourselves 
um, can be targeted to what her symptoms are. So women with severe um, nausea and vomiting of pregnancy or HG, the daytime use of ondansetron combined with nighttime dosing um, of a more sedating antiemetic may help. And steroids um, may also be considered, um, they can improve appetite and weight gain as well. Um, steroids have been linked with a possible increase of oral clefts when they're used under 10 weeks gestation, but the data is weak. Um, and it's advised to switch from a H2 antagonist to a PPI like um, ESO and Meprazole. IV fluids as required. Um, these women may potentially be managed as outpatients or may require admission. Women with refractory symptoms do require inpatient management um, and might need treatment with IV thiamine or TPN. Those, those are rare cases. Um, in addition, any women with comorbidities such as type 1 diabetes need earlier consideration for hospitalisation. And as I mentioned before, all women um, with nausea and vomiting of pregnancy are at risk from constipation, particularly those using ondansetron, um, and they may require laxatives. So um, a critical part of the initiative was to look at ways to develop and streamline pathways to care within our existing system. Um, to help minimise multiple presentations to ED for the management of um, HG symptoms and IV rehydration. So potential pathways to care include direct referral from the GP to a hospital in the home, um, which can provide in-home care with assessment, IV rehydration and provision of antiemetics, um, and then they can discharge care back to the GP. Um, or of course, any woman who presents to the ED can have a direct referral to the hospital in the home service. So. Um, importantly for women who um, are referred to the hospital in the home service um, for management of HG, they can be fast tracked for booking with an appropriate obstetric provider, um, including GP shared care. So I'll just reiterate um, that at the moment these are um, in the very early stages of development, but this is what we're hoping to do. Um, here at Gosford, we're very lucky to have an established hospital in the home program. And we've um, had some really great early collaboration with that service to, um, to be able to refer women in there. So um, we'll let you know when, when that pathway is up and running, but that's, that's the gold standard and that's what we're aiming for. So um, just, just towards the end here, I'm not sure where my quote went. Um, so that slide should say, um, what does the future hold? So in 1855, the famous novelist Charlotte Bronte died four months into her pregnancy as, as a result of severe nausea and vomiting. Shortly before she died, she wrote, let me speak the plain truth. My sufferings are very great. My nights, indescribable, sickness with scare reprieve. I strain until what I vomit is mixed with blood. So that was written by Charlotte Bronte in 1855. So for many, many decades now, women have been expected to suffer the burden of nausea and vomiting in pregnancy as a normal part of the journey to motherhood. Their distress with the illness has been trivialised and women expected to tolerate the many significant symptoms. And this has been compounded by doctors' reluctance to prescribe medications, particularly in the first trimester, and women's tendency to avoid medications despite being ill. The thalidomide tragedy of the 1950s and 60s has sown reticence on many fronts and it's appropriate that as a society we change attitudes through research, education and evidence. So where to from here? So um, the key points that um, we'll be developing a steering committee to drive the project. We've recruited several key groups for this and we'd love to hear from any GPs who'd be interested in our committee. We're waiting on the ministry's guidelines to, to be published. Um, and Jane and I are going to continue providing ongoing education to the relevant departments so that the changes um, that have, have occurred are foremost in clinicians' minds when they care for women with HG. And a core part of this is ensuring that the PUKI tool becomes a standard assessment tool. Um, we're looking forward to the HIP service um, and working closely with their team to get this service active for women. Um, and once the local protocols and referral pathways for that are in place, we'll be updating the PHN um, with that pathway um, because um, GPs are you know, such a um, critical part of um, this process. Um, and once that's been implemented for a pilot period, we will evaluate the data. So thanks. Put that back to the team. Great. 
Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, Penelope, we'll, we'll go over to the questions now. Mm. Yeah, um, so there is a question. Yeah, I can I can see one question. So if there are others, then I'm not looking in the right place. So one of the questions is what um, are our thoughts on a woman who has an RH negative partner um, in pregnancy? And this is obviously always something that people think about. Um, we don't want to cast aspersions on our patients, but we do have to think about the possibility of non-paternity in every pregnancy. The approach that is taken within the hospital system is that for anti-D, women are appropriately counselled about the risks to their pregnancy of rhesus disease for them, for the current and future pregnancies. And if they are happy to have anti-D, then they sign a consent form for this. But equally, if they decline anti-D, then they also sign a consent form for this as well, um, understanding why we are offering it to them. Uh, so I would advise in primary care that a similar route is taken, that you counsel women appropriately as to the risks and then she can make an informed choice as to whether or not she wishes to have anti-D in that pregnancy and it's appropriately documented. Great, thank you. Um, I can read you the next question. No, it I, is, well, can you see it now? Any other questions? Are there other questions? Yes, thank you. Yes, it, uh, will EPAS no, yes. contact us? Uh, um, wait, will EPAS? Okay. If there are, sorry, it's just a bit of background noise there. I think it might be in, in your room, Rach. Yeah. Um, so will EPAS contact us if they are referring the lady back to us? I was under the yeah, impression sorry, I can that see it. Up. And so there's a question um, about. Yep. Can you hear me, Penelope? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, you want... Yes, I can hear you and I can see the question. Um, some women will complete. Some... Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. I think it's just your internet's lagging a tiny bit. Um, that's all. Yes. You want... I'll read it out for you. Will EPAS contact okay. us if they're referring no. the lady back to us? I was under the impression they followed up and to use it. Um, because I don't work full time, so cannot keep a close eye on anyone. Yeah. yeah. So, so some women may complete their care within the early pregnancy service, but obviously um, the medical care may be completed, but they may need further follow up, um, whether that's from a mental health perspective or whether that's for um, linking back in with a primary care um, facilitator for, pre for further conversations around fertility and preconception care. So um, they may be referred back because of those needs to have those conversations. Or some women may prefer to complete their care with their GP if they have a healthcare provider that they're really comfortable with. And so in that context, we would be referring them back to their healthcare provider with potential telephone contact rather than appointments. Uh, so it is individualised care based on the circumstances of the woman in that pregnancy and also what her wishes are for her continuation continuation of her care. Great. Thank you so much. And that brings us to the end of the session. That's the questions. It looks like you've covered everything else, which is amazing. So thank you. Um, thank you all for being here with us tonight. We really appreciate it. And just a reminder to everyone that there will be a poll after the session um, and that's how we collect uh, that data for further events. Thank you all. Have a lovely Monday night and a beautiful week. Good night, everyone.